the 2004 film The Terminal, Tom Hanks played a guy without a country. After his fictional country falls due to a military coup, Hanks's character has a passport that is meaningless without a home country that no longer exists. He's stuck living inside an airport terminal. Now, while the terminal is fiction, it's loosely inspired by the story of an Iranian refugee who was forced to live in a Paris airport for nearly 20 years. But surely in America, it couldn't happen here. Americans couldn't lose their citizenship overnight. Well, to borrow a phrase from Sinclair Lewis, it can happen here. The United States has, in fact, a long history of stripping citizenship for various reasons, either legislation passed by Congress or judicial decisions or a combination of both. The U.S. history of citizen stripping is detailed in the book, You Are Not American, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers, whose author, Amanda Frost, joins us right now. Amanda, thank you for joining us, if I'm allowed to call you Amanda, and welcome to Democracy Nerd. Yes, thank you for having me, and please do call me Amanda. Citizen stripping. I have to say, as someone with, I don't know, born here privilege, not just white guy privilege, but not just nat naturalized citizen privilege, citizen stripping didn't sort of seem the thing that even crossed my mind sufficiently, but also didn't seem like the sort of thing that should occur in a democracy. There's a lot of discussion about hard, how hard it should be to get citizenship, but there isn't that much discussion about what it takes to lose it. How did you get in on this? How did you start digging in? Yeah, I think what first um, made me interested in this topic and really shocked me was learning that for about 20 years, starting in 1907, uh, U.S. citizen women, native-born women, people born in the United States, um, lost their citizenship automatically upon marrying a non-citizen. And that really shocked me. And that sent me looking to see if there were other examples of this. And once I sort of pulled at that thread, I realized that actually, as interesting as that question of who can be a citizen and who can naturalize is, I found even more fascinating this history of taking away citizenship because I thought it really told me a lot about um, how Americans thought of themselves in terms of who they tried to take away citizenship from. So it felt like an important and uh, important story that had not been told. So other than the Dred Scott decision, yeah. which led, you know, of course had to do with slavery and the dreamers, uh, what are other reasons, and you can feel free to lay those out also, yeah. what are some of the key reasons that citizenship is stripped? I, it, it makes my mind maybe too quickly go to a bygone era of imagining smaller tribes and lots of open space where you could go somewhere else, right? And then where exile, loss of citizenship could in fact be a meaningful yeah. punishment. Now, there is nowhere else. Everywhere is somewhere with uh, with very few exceptions. But what are the typical rationale or atypical rationale for losing citizenship in the United States? Yeah. So um, I, I will talk a little bit about Dred Scott because I think it's so foundational. And I will also say it wasn't always about deporting people because taking away citizenship is also taking away key rights, like the right to participate in the democracy. And sometimes that was the goal. More than getting rid of the people, it was um, a proxy for taking away rights that such as to vote or to hold office. But starting with Dred Scott, I do think that's really important because our constitution quite remarkably, does not define who a citizen is. So they did have some references to citizenship. You have to be a citizen um, for a certain number of years to serve in the Senate, nine years, and seven to be in the, serve in the House of Representatives, and a natural-born citizen to be president. But it didn't say who was a citizen. And that was a really open and contested question in the era when our country was grappling with slavery, the institution of slavery, and the status of free Black people. So the Dred Scott case came to the Supreme Court in 1857, and the court declared that no Black person, slave or free, could ever be a citizen of the United States. And uh, people, many people were shocked by the entire decision, which went beyond that, and particularly by that aspect of it, and thought it was very wrong. But I do think it was referencing this open question in our Constitution, in our entire country, about how this group of people would be treated. So post-Civil War, the Congress, the Radical Reconstruction Congress addressed this by saying, we are amending our constitution to define citizen as persons born in the United States, everyone born in the United States, regardless of race, religion, uh, immigration status of your parents, any aspect of yourself, you are a citizen, we are all equal. And it was part of that anti-caste goal. But then as I catalog in the book, people nonetheless kept losing citizenship. Women, um, naturalized citizens who protested the government or who appeared to be disloyal or lack allegiance to the U.S. lost citizenship. 
Mexican Americans, people born in the U.S. to Mexican immigrant parents were deported in large numbers in the 1930s and again in the 1950s. Um, Japanese Americans were coerced into renouncing their citizenship during World War II. So there's lots of examples, often based on race, sometimes on political belief or ideology or the government going after its enemies. And all of these examples show us that we were struggling with who is an American? What does that mean? So you teach citizenship law. You've delved into sort of the array, not only stripping, but also gaining, also some history. I would like to dance with a little bit of history. How does, and maybe even some comparisons, how does citizenship in the United States compare with citizenship in other countries? We can deal with that in terms of how hard it is to lose or how hard it is to get. Yeah. So, and actually I should say, I'm working on a second book on the history of birthright citizenship in the United mm -hmm. States, that the history of the 14th Amendment's birthright citizenship um, uh, provision, because I'm fascinated by that history. I think birthright citizenship is very important to who American, America, to what America is today. It literally made America, right? We, we, our definition of who an American is was based on that clause. So um, a couple of things about it, and I'll speak in some generalities. There's lots of like legal minutiae I won't get into. Um, but, you know, and don't feel of, free to get I mean, the, the the show is not called democracy on the surface. Right. We feel free to <laughs> dwell into whatever detail you so choose. Right. right. We'll try. Okay, to I'll try. Um, I certainly am not a history of uh, an expert on the global citizen sure. rules of citizenship. But I will say, broadly speaking, that not every country has birthright citizenship. And in fact, the United States is it's not the only country with a pure birthright citizenship rule today, but it's one of uh, a smaller number. So what I mean by that is if you're born in the United States, you are a citizen, regardless of whether your parents are citizens, whether you stay in the United States for any length of time, et cetera. It's a pure rule of birthright citizenship. Now, there's uh, Europe, some European countries used to have uh, closer to a pure birthright citizenship rule. Some never did. Like Germany was a, a country in which you could not be a citizen just by being born in that country. It was entirely citizenship by descent. You inherited it from your parents. And I think it's really important that the United States rejected that rule and that it's kept a pure birthright citizenship rule, because what we are saying is America is not an ethnocentric country. We are not a country about lineage, about race or transmission of your religion from one generation to the other or your or your race or your ethnicity or who your parents were or their status. Every generation begins anew. Every generation is equal. Every generation, it's like a reset button, right? And I think that's really important in a, in a country like ours, which grappled with racialized slavery, which of course has grappled with the civil rights for certain groups who've been discriminated against based on their race. So to say we are all equals, even though of course we've fallen short on that at many times is a really important principle for our nation. Um, and it, as it, it extends to today, I would say what I was interested in as I researched this book was the fact that Americans, if you ask them about you know, what their con the constitution says, a lot of people are a little confused, but a huge number of people, like I think it's close to 90%, correctly say that they know the rule that if you're born in the U.S., you're a U.S. citizen. I think it's like part and parcel of our understanding of what our nation is about, that we are about the fact that residence here, being here is what matters, not who your parents are. And as I said, that is quite different from the rules of many other countries where if you're born in the country, you have to live there a certain number of years before you're a citizen or it turns on who your parents are. And we've rejected that. In terms of the habit of stripping, were there times that have had more stripping, less stripping? Obviously, I'm sure the answer is yes. Any, uh, and does it follow any particular trend or is it sort of happenstance if you were going to bend an arc of this history, would it bend a particular direction? How could we understand this story? Yeah. So it's changed over time. So I'll just give a little bit of the sort of background here. I think it, our, our views of how we could take away citizenship, the, the government's view um, of, of taking away citizenship has changed over time. So I see Dred Scott as a citizenship stripping case. It's a case in which the Supreme Court in one decision said over 4 million people, that is both um, slaves and freed black people in 1857 could never be citizens. Um, and that had not been so clear, but the Supreme Court tried to make it clear. And of course we went to war in part over that decision, but really over the institution of slavery. And then emerging in 1865, we had a situation where there were two groups of people who were not citizens. We had all the newly freed slaves um, and the free blacks living in the US, over 4 million people, they were not citizens because Dred Scott said they weren't. And while slavery was abolished, citizenship had not been established yet for that group. And then we had the slaveocracy as they were often called by the Reconstruction Congress, the 
members of Congress who, uh, sorry, the members of the Southern leadership who had voted to secede and who had led the secession and led the Civil War for the Confederacy, they weren't citizens either. They'd lost their citizenship rights. And Reconstruction Congress decided we need to make sure that this free Black population becomes citizens, and in fact, that all people do. And they recognized that immigration was going to be a force in the United States, building our nation as it always had been, including immigration of non-white people. And it said, we want all of those children of immigrants to automatically be citizens too. This is part of the debate they had in 1866. So that created this rule of citizenship. But then as we saw the retrenchment, we saw Reconstruction fail in many different ways. We saw many forces fight against citizenship and try to take away citizenship. And I'm happy to walk through those or, or if you'd like me to continue or if you have a question to go. I'm enjoying us. it. Please yeah. continue. All right. So so I see the, the first and most important case and one I wish more people knew about as being uh, in 1898. And, and this, this the backstory to this case is fascinating. So a man named Wong Kim Ark was born in San Francisco's Chinatown in 1870. So he was born an American citizen under that birthright citizenship clause. His parents were Chinese immigrants. And in fact, they were barred by federal law from naturalizing, so they could never become citizens. And they eventually traveled back to China. But Wong Kim Ark remained in the United States. And he would occasionally go to China and visit them. And in fact, he married a woman in China, um, in part because he was barred by our anti-miscegenation laws from marrying a white person in the United States. And there weren't that many Chinese women, uh, uh, women of Chinese ethnicity in the United States. And one day when he was about 24 years old, he was coming back into the United States, one of like three or four trips he'd made. And he was picked as the test case because the U.S. government, the federal government, decided that it was going to argue that the children of Chinese immigrants were not citizens. And this, of course, was part of an overarching anti-Chinese animus. And the Solicitor General of the United States, who led the way, was himself the former owner of slaves. He'd fought for the Confederacy. He was really refighting the Civil War when he brought this case. And it was a close case. And there was a real question how it would come out. And in fact, it was a remarkable position the U.S. government took. It took the position because it couldn't, um, based on the Constitution, only target the children of Chinese immigrants. So it took the position in the Supreme Court that all the children of immigrants were not citizens of the United States. If they'd won that case, think of how that would have changed our country. And in fact, they put off the oral argument until after the elections, because it would have destabilized our entire democracy. Who could run for office? Who could vote um, if all these people weren't citizens? The Supreme Court rejected the government's argument, although it was close, it was a close case. It wasn't, it wasn't an automatic win, and it took over a year to decide. And I think of that as foundational. But following on from that, the federal government didn't give up. We saw in 1907 the law passed that said if you're a woman and you marry a non-citizen, you automatically lose your citizenship. And the woman I, I profile here in the book is a woman named Ethel McKenzie, who had fought as a suffragist for the right of women in California to vote. In California, women won that right before the rest of the nation got it in the 19th Amendment. And she herself then went to cast her vote and was barred because she'd married a non-citizen. And she fought, she fought all the way to the Supreme Court, but she lost 9-0. And the Supreme Court said, you chose to marry a non-citizen and that's basically you know, your fault for doing that. And therefore the consequences, you lose your citizenship. I'm happy to say that shortly after women got the right to vote, in the Constitution. They, of course, gained enormous political power overnight. Eventually, a woman was elected to Congress, one of only six at the time in 1928, named Ruth Bryan Owen. She herself had at one point lost her citizenship because she'd married an Englishman. She was incensed by this. And when she got to Congress, she helped change the law for the nation and make sure women didn't lose their, right, their citizenship or the right to vote. Um, and we could see the pattern follow from there. We see the way Japanese Americans were treated during the Second World War as not real Americans, right? We see the way Mexican Americans similarly were treated. And we see the way uh, political, uh, you, really people who were fighting for labor rights in the US were targeted. So I will say eventually the Supreme Court stepped in and said, you can't do that. And today citizenship stripping still happens, but it looks very different as we can discuss. So I want to stick with that time period, right? Yeah. So on the entrance to my downstairs bathroom, is 1906 in tile. My house was built either in 1906 or 1908, depending on which book you read or which city record you listen to. And it could have been all, could have been both, right? It could have been started in 1906 and they first moved in 1908, who knows. Yeah. But it has made me perk up my ears a little bit to that time. Mm 
Yeah. I visited Barcelona and that was around the time also when Gaudi was disrupting architecture in the world. In 1904 yeah. is when St. Louis had their World's Fair. 1906 is when yeah. Italy had theirs. That I've thought about this time, right? That yeah. that in the midst of in the United States is the progressive era, uh, that a different political movement is happening in Russia. And and I've and I wish I could take all of the facts and plug it into my own AI brain, which I do, do not have, and, and sort of connect all the dots. There were over a million people who moved to the United States. You talk about how much history would have changed, like the much of the growth of America, which mo much of what America what put America in the position to become a world power and to compete in World War II in the way it was and to become kind of the, the, the unleashed dragon that it was in World War II was because of these waves of immigration that were happening in the first part of the 20th century, at the very end of the 19th century, is my you know cocktail napkin historical understanding. What was spurring, so uh, correct me on any of that, of course, but what was spurring Spurring those yeah. ways, we had better boats. Was it that people were paying more attention? Was it the advent of radio, so people yeah. were like, like looking around more? What was going on that was spurring this in immigration? Yeah, so of course, a number of different forces, and you know, that's America is a nation of immigrants. At least, you know, that's I think. While at times we've been more or less welcoming, we tend to think of ourselves that way, and I think it is an accurate depiction. And certainly during the era you're describing, uh, the statistic I like to repeat is. Um, one quarter of Ireland uh, migrated to the United States. That was between 1845 and 1952 because of the wow. famine. Um, immigrants came in the era you're describing too at the turn of the 20th century in large numbers. And there was a number of reasons for that. It's it's still true today, push factors and pull factors. So lack of opportunity, economic hard times, sometimes political unrest in their home country combined with opportunity and uh, an ability to thrive in the United States that immigrants couldn't see in their home country. So both those combined. The US so also the Industrial Revolution meant there were jobs here. Meant, yeah. meant oh, absolutely. You had, you had it, Chinese families building railroads. You had uh, Irish families building a number of things, et cetera. Still true today. Like we yep. we we bring in, people come because Americans employ them, <laughs> you know, and yeah. whether they come legally or not, Americans employ them. And uh, that's true today and was true back then. And that was a reason for the enormous a surge in migration was we were a country that could provide jobs. We were just stretching out to the West Coast. We needed, we are an unpeopled continent and need, or let, lightly peopled, and we needed more labor. And so, so that was a huge pull. Yeah. So in, in reaction to a surge of immigrants, uh, and according to, I think you, uh, which topped 1.2 million in 1907, uh, represented over 1% of the country's population, the Expatriation Act of 1907 is passed. And it stripped American women of their citizenship via the legal concept. Is it coverture? Yes. Yes. And I was going to say, actually, immigrants were close to 15 percent of the population. Oh, which, holy mackerel. I got that wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, they're like 13 to 14 percent today, um, which is also coming close to that high. So, yeah. yeah. So with the surge in immigration becoming a significant percentage of the U.S. population, came of some and, and some economic hard times in the US brought with it some xenophobia. We see this sort of cyclical relationship. So that marital expatriation law where women lost their citizenship for marrying non-citizens, in part, it was hostility to the idea of foreigners coming and marrying US citizen women, for sure, that was some xenophobia. And it was also, of course, this idea of coverture, as you just mentioned, which is that women were not considered to have a separate legal identity from their husbands. So lots of ways in which this operated, things like women couldn't have a bank account, they couldn't own property, they couldn't bequeath their property, they couldn't enter contracts. And interestingly to me is they 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 had one passport for the family, like there'd be one passport in the husband's name and like it was for the kids and the wife too. And I think the idea was you couldn't have a separate citizenship for husband and wife, you had to have the same. And I will say the law worked the other way too. So US citizen men who married non-citizen women, those non-citizen women immediately became US citizens. And Congress said, we just think the, the male U.S. citizen will guide them in adopting American values and will ensure and instill in them these American values. So it was very patriarchal, obviously, but very much about coverture, about one legal identity for the husband and wife, and that is the husband's identity, and also some xenophobia all mixed up together. Geographically, the time period, the dominant areas where immigration was coming is this italy is this ireland where is it all over yeah. the place where were the where was the driving you yeah. know, kind of push forces so um 
I will say that the immigrant flows were coming more from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe towards the, you know, 19, and I don't have the, all the dates perfectly sure. here, but, you know, in the, in the early 20th century. And in response, the U.S. reacted with some significant restrictions on immigration. And before the 1924 quota law, which put into place some real restrictions, the U.S. had had almost no restrictions on immigration except for the Chinese, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act, and then the, actually the, really all of Asia had been barred, obviously racist exclusionary laws, but it hadn't been applied worldwide. And then Congress reacted in 1924, starting in 1921, but it put it in place firmly in 1924. And it tried to limit, and did succeed in limiting immigration, barring it almost completely from Asia, almost uh, completely from Asia, pretty much, almost completely from Africa, like a couple hundred people. And then also limiting numbers from Europe, uh, Southern and Eastern Europe, but allowing Western Europe to come. So that was, of course, trying to sort of, people always said the U.S. was better 30 years ago, they said in 1924, and they wanted to bring back the U.S.'s demographics to what it looked like 30 years Well, they years wanted ago. to make America great again. Exactly. Everyone always thinks 30 years before was the best time, although I don't. <laughs> but well, I, I it, will tell you, I was more athletic 30 years ago. Yeah, like, like yeah, I think, yeah, that, I, I think. I think we I think many of us probably do have nostalgic memories of 30 years ago yeah. being pretty cool, right? Yeah. Even when we're 35, five years old is pretty fun, right? Yeah. When we're 55, 25 is pretty great. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, and I looked it up. So I, and I, of course I should have thought of it. This is where so this is a time of like a lot of Polish, like you know, Austria, Hungary, Russian, and Polish immigration. We start getting Polak jokes, right? Yeah. Around the around the beginning of the century. All right, thank you. This is helpful to me. I like connecting yeah. the dots in my own yeah. darn brain. All yeah. right. So I want to ask about what more it me meant for women to lose their citizenship under the Expatriation Act. You had an example. I think it was Lillian Larch. Yeah. So th there was a number of consequences. I already mentioned Ethel McKenzie fought for the right to women for women to vote, could not vote herself after she married a non-citizen because she was not a citizen. So it affected political rights. Lillian Larch was one of the examples of people who really deeply suffered because she had come into the United States um, sorry, had been a U.S. citizen, married a non-citizen, lost her citizenship, and she was impoverished with, I think, five children, if I remember correctly. And she did get deported because, of course, you lose your citizenship and you don't have the right to remain. Um, and she was deported because the U.S. didn't want to. They, they said not a citizen and a drain on our state, uh, our country. And we don't want to use our social welfare network, limited as it was, to support her. So she was deported and no one knows what became of her, but her situation was dire at the time that she was deported. Her husband, I believe, had died. And she was, you know, a non-citizen suddenly in a country that she'd always thought of her own. She was born in the U.S. And there's other examples like that in the book, including a woman who had all of their assets seized because they'd married a German. And then uh, in World War One, of course, Germany was an, Amer you know, an enemy and their assets were seized under federal laws that allowed the government to seize the assets of enemies. And suddenly these U.S. citizen women were viewed as the enemy because they'd become German and were no longer American. Some of them were outside the U.S. trying to get back in and weren't allowed back in because they'd married non-citizens. So, and, and this was a turbulent time, right? World War I, where they were in danger and couldn't get back to their country. So the, these stories, some of them, are they suffered deeply. And other people just suffered beyond losing political and civil rights, which, of course, is a loss uh, in and of itself. So wealth and power has always provided some measure of exception or workaround. Mm -hmm. uh, if women were wealthy or politically connected, I suspect they had avenues to get citizenship restored. And I think here you offer the case of, is it Augusta Louise de Haven Alton? If you have the last name de Haven Alton, it, yeah. you sound important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there were people who were connected um enough politically to get congress to propose special legislation just to give them their citizenship back which i certainly don't blame them for using that avenue but as you can imagine it's not open to the vast majority of people and it's only open to those who are you know wealthy or politically powerful and even then they had difficulty and and some argued you know if you made a bad choice and a bad spouse and and you want to be divorced you know too bad for you you you, you chose your allegiance and it was with to marry a non-citizen um, so the wealthy and powerful did have an avenue back if they could get Congress to pass legislation just for them, but it wasn't an easy route. And women, I should say, mobilized politically and tried to fight this citizenship stripping law. And I was reading a transcript of a hearing in 19, I think it was 1917. So before women got the right to vote in our U.S. Constitution, they had a hearing before Congress where they testified about the effects of this law on women. And 
you know, they were very eloquent. They said, we we value and treasure our citizenship just like you do, saying to the male, all male Congress. And it, you, you can't, of course, get a recording of this 1917 hearing, but there's in the transcript little brackets for laughter. And the, the congressmen are laugh. They're like, oh, you know, just marry a good old American boy. And if you don't do that, that's not your problem, laughter. You know, what's interesting to me is like less than five years later, right after women get the right to vote, suddenly Congress is tripping over itself to repeal this law because women have political power. And it just shows you that the lesson there is give people political power when you want to ensure their rights are protected. Because suddenly Congress said, this is an archaic and terrible law. However, they only repealed it in ways that affected white women or benefited white women at first. It took a while before it was, and I could explain some of the details of that, but the way in which it first worked was white women who married white men kept their citizenship. But for example, um, a woman who married a, a, a man from China or Japan who was not a US citizen and couldn't be usually because they couldn't naturalize. They're barred under federal law by these race restricted naturalization laws. Those women lost their citizenship because the law was framed that way. So race played a role as well as gender. In, in this. So, so we start saying, and may I start is probably an overstatement, but we, we see a, a more explicit rift between immigration based on just what nation you're from and based on how you racially present. So you yeah. said you said white women and white men. You didn't say citizen women and citizen men. So you're talking yeah. about if somebody presented as Polish, presented as Italian, presented as uh, as Irish, that 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 uh, that that marriage would count, that though that citizenship would count. But if someone presented as Chinese, presented as Japanese, they would not. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, the way the law was framed is it said if a, a woman marries a non-citizen who is not eligible to naturalize, then she still loses her citizenship. But women who marry non-citizens who are eligible to naturalize can keep their citizenship. Well, that was a proxy for the race restrictions and naturalization because Asians were not permitted to naturalize under U.S. law until I mean, Chinese weren't permitted until 1943. Um, so these race restrictions were a big part of what was going on here. Now, I'm, I am happy to say, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, Ruth Bryan Owen eventually got elected to Congress, one of the very first women to do so in 1928. She herself was white and from the South, and nonetheless, she fought to end the last vestiges of these racial restrictions that were stripping women of their citizenship for marrying non-citizen men ineligible to naturalize. So that's that you know, women getting elected to office eventually resulted in the end of these laws. You mentioned Ethel McKenzie. I wanted to dig into that a little yeah. bit more because as I think about history, that's another thing. I Another reference that, another connection that comes clear or at least arises that is the middle of the progressive era, the early days of the progressive era in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And towards the latter portion, that's, that's when California, for instance, when I think in your book, you talk about Ethel McKenzie was located. I think we said, you think you said San Francisco. San Francisco, uh, yeah. And, and, the, and, 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 Proposition 4, 1911 is when, I don't remember, I know in Oregon, it took five times. I don't remember the yeah. history of California, how close it was, but I think you talk about it. So you should have a chance, you know, yeah. you, you should take the chance to, but yeah. the, but the interaction that you already offered, one of the interactions of that was that because of women's suffrage, some of this started to change, yeah. uh, but talk more about that time period and sort of the intersection between kind of bending the arc of history around, around uh, sex and gender justice yeah. alongside the struggle yeah. of immigration and, and stripping citizenship. Yeah. Yeah. And I was really moved to read the history of the suffrage movement in California, particularly, which I had not known before I began researching the book. As I said, one inspiration for the book was Ethel McKenzie, because she was such a fascinating firecracker of a person. She was born the only child to a wealthy vintner in San Francisco, and she lived a life of wealth and privilege. And she didn't seem like she'd been a particularly serious, you know, political person, she joined, uh, Ethel McKenzie joined one of these uh, um, sort of groups of women who were fighting for suffrage. And she got what they call suffrage fever and she began fighting hard for women's suffrage. And in fact, and I don't have the date at my fingertips, but women who tried in California in the past to get the right to vote, a couple of Western states gave women the right to vote and California tried to become one of them and failed. I think it was in the 1890s. And there was real you know, fear that they would fail again. And in fact, I found some headlines in the local papers, even the day after the vote to give women the right to vote, that said they'd, they'd, they'd failed to succeed. It was such a close vote. And Ethel McKenzie fought you know, hard in this incredible political mobilization. They put up posters all over San Francisco saying things like, give your daughter the same chance as your son, the same opportunity as your son. Like They appealed to people who had daughters, which I think is a powerful way to, to frame it. 
and they had to appeal to men. I mean, the people who voted to give women the right to vote were men and they had to say, it's in your interest. And they had to create lots of political coalitions. And they, you know, as I said, came so close to losing that in fact, some of the headlines of the papers the next day were women didn't win the right to vote. But they, when they finished the counting by razor thin margins, women had won the right to vote in California. And that led the way. We would not have had the 19th Amendment, at least when we did, without California women helping to vote it into effect um, and, and mobilizing for it. Uh, which happened about a decade later. So um, she was part of this vanguard of women. And they, I was so impressed because they fought on every level for years in every way they could. And it reminded me that's how political change happens. You have to, it, it's not some big sweeping moment. It's you have to fight like tooth and nail for years. And as I said, then she herself tried to vote and was barred by this citizenship stripping law. And then she fought that. So she was a marvel. And by the end of her life, she did get citizenship back. And um, I was happy to see that and sort of the happy ending there. And there is still, there is now a Mackenzie Vineyards in about two oh. hours outside San Francisco. I don't know if it's the same Mackenzie, but it was oh. started first established by an Everett Mackenzie who was born in 1895. So it seems like the odds of there being a being yeah. some familiar relationship, at least for non-zero, might, <laughs> might, might not be related or not, might be related or not. Yeah. So, uh, so interesting. Lawmakers didn't consider the act would strip American women the right to vote, except for in a handful of states at that point, because the right wasn't granted to women that dawned on them. Uh, what next? So anything else sort of in this time period, this time yeah. sort of key time period, you said yeah. 1880, 1920, or maybe I said that in terms of big yeah. a big wave of immigration yeah. and then and a, and a couple of different moves. Do we have anything else we want to dig into on that time period or move ahead a little bit? You know, we can move ahead. I will just say that the, the the biggest win on this issue was Wong Kim Ark's case, which I already talked about, where if the U.S. government had its way, the children of immigrants would not be citizens of the United States, which would have changed the course of history. Who was the, who was the president at the time and who was the attorney, who was the attorney general or who took yeah. the case for the United States? Yes, yeah, so the solicitor general was Holmes Conrad. And he was, I, I'm fascinated, I've looked up the archive, I've looked at his correspondence on this. Um, and also his brief that he filed in the Supreme Court, he argued that the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution shouldn't be read to give birthright citizenship to the children of, he had, he wanted to frame it in terms of the Chinese, but he couldn't because the law, the, the Constitution was written in broad universal terms. So he had to say non-citizen parents who have children in the U.S., their children aren't citizens. And then he said the 14th Amendment itself was unconstitutional because the Southern states of the Confederacy had been coerced into signing it, which you can see, you know, this was the son of slave owners, himself a slave owner until his twenties when the Civil War ended that, and he fought for the Confederacy. So um, he was trying to undo reconstruction and, uh, you know, he failed, but as I said, it was a very close vote and a really, you know, it was a moment where we were abandoning reconstruction as a nation. And there was a lot of cases in the Supreme Court that were lost. So Plessy versus Ferguson, which established that Jim Crow could, was permissible that separate could be equal and equal protection under the 14th amendment didn't bar Jim Crow segregation. That case was 1896. And then in 1898, Wong Kim wins his case and establishes birthright citizenship for the nation, or maybe reestablishes it because it was in the constitution. And so, so this is the McKinley administration. Yeah. You know, it's uh, funny. I'm not remembering off the top of my head who the president was. I, yeah, it's Cause I think, cause it's shortly thereafter that Teddy Roosevelt cause McKinley dies. And I think, and I, yeah, it wasn't I, Roosevelt. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I think it's, yeah. Yeah, that's my, uh, I, did, I did a report, of course, I did not cover this case, but when I was in third grade, fourth grade, fourth grade, yeah. I did a report on William McKinley. So after the yeah. report, I was convinced William McKinley was the greatest president in history, just because yeah. that was the president I happened to do a report on. And the books you read when you're in fourth grade about presidents, they're very laudatory. They do not cover any, any, any disagreement about economic policy or national policy. But, uh, and now I have a different view of William McKinley. Well, actually, you know, it's interesting because it's true that McKinley was president starting in 1897, I believe. But ah, oh, but the case started uh, earlier. Uh, did he? No, okay. I wonder. Oh, no, I was wondering. No, no, the, I was wondering if this case started earlier. I was yeah, guessing it did. what Sorry, you were going to yes. say next. It, it absolutely did start earlier. So Got the it. question is, I don't think it was a presidential initiative. I maybe I'm going to dig more as I write. It's so Grover Cleveland, I believe, was the president when the case started. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, the case was the brainchild of. A couple of different people, but not particularly motivated by the president. It was, yeah. and if it was and, a southerner, it was a yeah. southerner that it, it, it could have been anybody, yeah. right? A southerner that was that was split. All right, yeah. well that's interesting. So we move forward from that era. What's the what's sort of the next what's sort of the next era of citizenship stripping that we should be looking at? 
Yeah. So the a couple of different things happen in the 30s. The first is this first red scare, this concern about communism. Um, and it, but in the book, I, I first of all, I tell the, the law through the stories of the people affected using their voices. It's not meant to be a legal history for academics. It's meant to be a book accessible to a mainstream audience and primarily told through the voices of people who lost citizenship and the fight for citizenship. And so in the 30s, there was this fear of you know, this, this Bolshevik communist revolution of violence, of, of violent takeover of the U.S. government. And and I will say, I try to be, sympathetic is the wrong word, but I try to sort of put yourself in the shoes of a nation that's undergoing the Great Depression with bread lines and starvation and dire time, you know, dire straits financially for so many and a sense of society unraveling. And I think there was some genuine fear. But the way the government reacted to this was to say that people that were fighting for the rights of workers, in particular labor leaders, that they targeted them for denaturalization. So these are folks who had become citizens through the naturalization process. And that process had to swear allegiance to the United States of America. And the government, if it found a labor leader who was a naturalized citizen, would then look back and say, okay, well, but you must have lied when you said you had allegiance to the United States. If you now are affiliating with the Communist Party or claiming any sympathies with, with anyone who's you know, outside the United States. And so we've decided you really lied when you said you had allegiance to the U.S. Well, you naturalized and therefore we use that to take away your citizenship. And so that was one one strand of citizenship stripping in the 1930s. And then also motivated by the Great Depression, uh, the government, particularly out in the West, um, a lot of the book takes place in the West, um, had a policy of rounding up and deporting, either coercing or sometimes forcing um, families of Mexican immigrants, perfectly legal immigrants, and their you know, native-born U.S. citizen children, and, and sometimes U.S. citizen adults, to leave the United States. Um, because the idea was, I think it was like real job, you know, real Americans should get the jobs. And of course, these people weren't viewed as quote unquote real Americans. So that was another, um, all sort of Great Depression focused uh, loss of citizenship during that era. What should define citizenship? I, I've, I've left to so much of the discussion now is the liberal-minded person uh, sees the reaction to immigration now, which is mostly, they're mostly that reaction is from the southerly border, right? There, it's, it's, it includes, you know, I Italians, Irish people, right? Polish people who are now saying, no, not from the southern border. It smacks a little bit of the reaction to Chinese immigration, uh, you know, a hundred years ago. And, and so it is, become an argument that I haven't listened to a thought, and this is my fault, not the discourse's fault, but it's, well, it's a little bit the discourse's fault. I haven't heard many thoughtful discussions around immigration, including yeah. the essential question of what should define citizenship for a while, because yeah. either I'm hearing something that sounds pretty close to send home, you know, Mexico, Mexicans and people from Ecuador, or it's people saying that's racist. Stop saying that. And, yeah. it, and the discussion doesn't get that much deeper. Yeah. That said, there is an, a country if it has borders. Yeah. If it do, if it doesn't have borders, right? If Donald Trump said it, well, if you don't have borders, you don't have a country. Yeah. There is still this question, yeah. like if you touch there, if you touch your finger on the land, are you a citizen? Do yeah. you have to earn it in some way? Can yeah. you lose it? It's, it's sort of interesting to me that we don't have a tradition of uh, losing citizenship if you were born here but committed a crime. Yeah. Right? You say no, no. Like, like here's where after five after five big crimes, you don't you're not an American anymore. That yeah. somehow conduct is not the thing that defines citizenship in this country for the most part, yeah. right? And but if you're born here, it does. And I understand most of this is decided by political decisions at various points with yeah. with various rationale as they happen, right? It's ha as much happenstance as it is ideology or theory. But I still, you've been dwelling on this now. I don't mean in this discussion, I mean in your career for a while. Yeah. And I'm genuinely fascinated about your yeah. own thoughts about what should define yeah. citizenship. Yeah. And these are really hard questions. I When I got into this field now decades ago, I had this sense of like, well, this is a contentious area, the immigration portion of this, but I'll, yeah. I'll come to a conclusion of like what the best policies are. And while I do have some ideas about how things could be improved, because boy, do they need to be improved. I, I have no clear, I mean, this is really difficult and a real yeah. uh, dilemma for the United States right now. So some of your question goes to immigration, I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll start with your, your last question, which is, you know, what should define citizenship? So as I said, I'm writing a book on birthright citizenship because I think it's so essential to who we are as a country. And I will say 
that while we could debate naturalization and immigration, and there's lots of interesting debates there, I think the history of the United States strongly supports, really requires us to have this birthright citizenship rule we put in place for a couple of reasons. One is because of our history, because of the idea that we rejected people and wanted to have them live among us as a permanent undercast class or caste. And I think that's what we've been rejecting. And indeed, it's sort of foundational to who we are, right? It was we, the United States of America, break apart from England because we are not going to be governed by a king. We are going to govern ourselves. It's consent of the people. And the government can't choose its citizens. The citizens choose the government. And we are going to all be equal, right? That's also in the Declaration of Independence. Um, we are all created equal. And so that's also essential that we all start off at the same level playing field as citizens. So that rule, I think, is so important to who we are as a nation. So part of our identity, so essential as our part of our history. But the second part of your question about how do we deal with immigration, that is a really tough question. And if you're if you're for open borders, right, then it seems easy to you. I'm not an open borders person. If you're like deport everyone who's undocumented and very much limit immigration flows, then I suppose maybe those questions are easy. I'm certainly not on that side. I don't think those questions are easy. I actually think those questions are hard. It's hard to get that person to stand up, to have their arguments stand up. I understand it might, they might be able to respond quickly. That might seem yeah. easy, but it ain't simple. But anyway, continue in yeah, that, in that I space agree. betwixt. It's yeah. It's only that they, their tricky. legal rule is simple. They can't actually implement right. the rule. Nor can right. the, so, but to go to the point of like, okay, you know, what, what rules should we have regarding immigration to the U.S.? Our system is broken, I would agree right now with people who say that and people on both sides of the political spectrum say that. But my answer would be Americans are employing these people like in droves. They, there's some industries are dominated by undocumented immigrants. They're five percent of the economy. And of course, there's legal immigrants working, too. I always want to be clear, like there's undocumented immigrants. There's also legal immigrants who are lawfully present and also working in significant numbers, and our nation needs them and benefits from these people. And what we need to do is create more pathways. The number We only have 140,000 green cards we give out based on employment a year. That number was set in 1990. That was an entirely different country economy back then. We need updated um, numbers that allow more people to come and work in the United States legally, and that will protect them. It will protect Americans who work alongside them. And the idea that we're going to crack down on undocumented immigrants without changing the immigration flows that come legally is, to me, a huge mistake. Because for one thing, about 80 percent of the people that harvest our crops are undocumented. If we did deport them all, we would starve <laughs> or food would cost way more. Yeah. And so I think the answer is we need to acknowledge what we're doing, which is hiring undocumented immigrants. And we need immigrants and allow them to come legally. And that's what needs to change. And Congress needs to change it. Yeah. And. And I appreciate that. And we don't have to dwell entirely on this. And yeah. I, I will say I'm motivated a little bit about my recent experience that yeah. I have a colleague uh, named Hijay, and she is from South Korea. She came as an intern years ago through a sort of official South Korean program. She's deeply talented. She wants to come to the United States. Our country would be better if she were here. And like literally anybody who ever met her would yeah. say, yeah, our country would be better off if we yeah. had like a hundred Hijays or a thousand Hijays. Like they was, oh. we should be better. And it, it, it just, it, it boggles my mind. It, the recruiter in me, the person who is trying to, you know, yeah. is recruited for organizations and companies and, and recruited yeah. people to run for office. The recruiter in me is like, don't make it harder for me to recruit. Like, let's get the best people we can to do the yeah. things we need to get and do yeah. the things we need to do rather. And so it, it drives me a little bit crazy. And by the way, even people with different kind of economic or small D democratic philosophies that I have share sometimes my yeah. frustration on that thing, right? Absolutely. Like, in fact, this is, I, I, I always feel like, you know, what could I say that might convince somebody who maybe isn't pro-immigrant for all the reasons I am? And one of the things I like to say is, you know, Canada is piggybacking on our system and stealing people from us. So when we approve them to get visas called H-1B visas for temporary skilled workers, Canada says anyone who's got approval from the United States to be an H-1B visa holder, we will welcome you to Canada We've already, you've already been vetted and we will give you a better deal than America's giving you because there's lots of restrictions on H-1B visas and you can stay indefinitely and your kids could stay and we'll set you up. And they opened this up and like 10,000 people immediately jump from the U.S. to Canada. We're going to lose the race for immigrants and we need them in part because we're not reproducing ourselves. Our, our um, you know, native born population, the children of the native born are, are, are slowing in numbers and we're an aging population and we are going to be competing and fighting for immigrants. So we're, if, even if you're, even if your approach is purely economic benefit, yeah. no interest in humanitarian needs or diversity. No moral, them, no moral compass, really. No moral compass at all. You should want immigrants and we're going to lose out America will if we don't change our tune pretty soon. So let's dwell on this for a little bit, because again, yeah. these are, these are my, um, 
conclusions based on thin historical understandings, yeah. which I nonetheless hold very strongly. Yeah. So uh, visited Spain, mentioned Spain before. Yeah. And uh, and studied a little bit the Spanish Inquisition and the history of Spanish dominance. And one of the things that I know, it surprised me, but I took note of, was that the strongest times of the Spanish Empire were, and not coincidentally, simultaneous to where uh, to when rather the relations between the government of Spain and the Jewish population, the Muslim po- Muslim population, were at their friendliest. Right yeah. when when Spain was uh, doing less of the Inquisition. Spain was stronger. When it was doing more of the Inquisition, Spain was weaker. Yeah. And and if I strip nation away, it's like, well, yeah, because they were being really bad recruiters. <laughs> and yeah. They're being really bad. Set, again, set aside uh, humanitarian concerns, which maybe Trump, pun included, uh, pun, pun intended, you know, what I'm what I'm saying. But I do want to ask you, because you've looked at it more, is it but there's also a risk of motivated reasoning. There's also a risk of, well, I grew up in a liberal family who yeah. said diversity was a good thing. And therefore I hunt and find uh, yeah. examples of where diversity seemed to be good. And I remember those, right? Have you done or even noticed by happenstance yeah. uh, an incidence of correlation between immigration friendliness yeah. and strength and prosperity in a given nation? Yeah. So, I mean, that is more of a sort of economic analysis. So I am not an economist, but I've read plenty about their studies and they're included in my immigration case book I teach from. And the mainstream economist view is that immigrations benefit the United States. Now, I haven't studied sort of worldwide how, you know, there are various uh, effects of immigration, but I will say the economic view is that immigration benefits the United States. But if anyone's going to suffer from immigration, it is the very lowest on the socioeconomic ladder in the United States. Some of those people are economically harmed by immigration, even though the country as a whole, the pie is bigger with immigrants, but some people lose out. And so of course we should redistribute wealth with the form of support that comes from immigrants. We should make sure those those Americans don't suffer. And I'm very aware of that. I don't, as I said, I'm not an open borders person. I wouldn't say, you know, I would fear for the jobs of some Americans if we didn't have some restrictions, but on the whole, the mainstream economic view is that immigration benefits the United States. In fact, I think it's our superpower. Like you look at who the Nobel Prize winners are. They often live in the US and they were born elsewhere and they came here because we have the strongest universities, the research platforms for them to be here. When you look at who's running the tech companies, they're usually not the immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants. But those people, you bring them into the United States, they are born citizens. We, the United States, integrate people very well, better than Europe. It's something we do better in part because of birthright citizenship. They flourish in our country and become the leaders of technology, the leaders of industry. The, the They're the drivers, the economic drivers. It's our superpower. And yet we're trying to kill it. You know, that's that's my fear. So before anybody, people should double check this research because it was done hastily through the interwebs. Yeah. But it says here, according to the American Immigration Council, that 44.8% of Fortune 500 companies in 2023, equating to 224 companies, were founded by immigrants or their children. Yeah. Well, and I should add, because sometimes people don't realize this, as I was saying, like 14% of our country uh, because of foreign born, of about whom half of that people are, half of those people are now naturalized citizens. Also, another 10% are the children of immigrants. So 25% of our nation are either immigrants or the children of immigrants, meaning the immigration laws and policies that are in place today have crafted a quarter of our nation and they remake our nation a year, you know, decade after decade. They're vital to who we are. And they've been a source of strength for the for the most part, despite our fear, our times of xenophobia, our, our nation has mostly recognize that we need to have immigration. And I hope we're not in a, mer- a period of retrenchment, but it fear, I fear we are. In your work, in preparation for the book you've published, you might have, if you if the answer to this question is no, you might, it might apply to your next one. Was there anything that surprised you most or that disrupted a prior view? Anything that sort of yeah. shaped in a different way how yeah. you think about citizenship stripping or citizenship more broadly? Yeah. So, I mean, this first book, the one we've primarily been talking about um, involving citizenship stripping, You Are Not American is the title. That book I decided to write because I was shocked to learn the number and frequency of people that we'd taken away citizenship from. And that it occurs even to this day, which we've talked a little bit less about, not in the same numbers, but there's some threats from the Trump administration when they were in office. 
obviously threats if they come back, and also um, these sort of paperwork requirements, you, proof of citizenship documents, things like that. So that was a shocking revelation to me. And I thought that story had not been told. And that's why I wrote that first book. The second book, The Book to Come on Birthright Citizenship, what motivated that was actually much more positive. In some ways, it's like the the sunny side of the earlier book, because uh, it's my view that birthright citizenship is in the United States is different from what has come before in any other country. It was uniquely American, invented to solve the American problem of slavery and born of the Declaration of Independence and our founding values. And it's essential to who we are. And I wanted that story to be told in part because there's some threats to it. I mean, Trump and some other people have said the children of undocumented immigrants shouldn't be treated as citizens. That's wrong legally, wrong morally, and I think at odds with our values. So I wanted to tell that story in a, in a way that resonated. Well, if we have a chance to talk when the new book comes out, does it have a title yet? Um, I think Born in the USA, How All right. Birthright Citizenship Made America American, something like that. All right, that. we got to get Springsteen. We got Springsteen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Do, do, do the opening, do the opening yeah. act at some New York spot, I don't know, New Jersey spot. We have been talking with Amanda Frost, professor at the University of Virginia Law School, author of You Are Not American, Citizen Stripping from Dred Scott to the Dreamers. Thank you for your time, Professor. Thank you, Amanda, very much. Thanks for your work, and thanks for being a democracy nerd. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity.